Hey everybody, welcome to a new edition of PD and P Dubs Unscripted on this February 28th, the last day of February. So P Dubs, how's it going? Real good, PD. Good to see you. Good to be with you. Hey, thanks everybody for listening in on our podcast. We're so grateful that you find time to listen to us and uh, hope that you're finding what we're sharing of interest. Yeah, because I know we have a great time with these conversations and looking forward to having more as we're hoping you look forward to the new podcast when they come out each day, each week. Yeah, for sure. And uh, like you were alluding to, Pastor, can't believe it's the end of February. Right. I mean, it's like, where did the time go? It just flies by. And wouldn't you know it, like in just a matter of a few days, it's going to be Lent, Ash Wednesday. Yeah, just in two days, it's Ash Wednesday. What a crazy thing that March 2nd is Ash Wednesday. I know. And, um, you know, speaking of faith intersections, uh, for those who are listening, uh, come on out to Palatine at Emmanuel. Pastor and I will be out in our parking lot on uh, Wednesday morning from like 7 to, I don't know, how long should we stay out there? Like Like 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock. And if you are driving to work or just in between errands, We'll uh, be out there with some ashes. So if you'd like to have ashes uh, imposed on your forehead for Ash Wednesday, we're there for you. And then um, we'll be out there later in the afternoon too, right? Yeah, probably right after school. So maybe 1220-ish to maybe like 3 o'clock, I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And uh, and then we have our children uh, in our school. Our, we'll be leading a chapel service, and that ends around 2 o'clock. So we'll probably have some time inside church. So you're welcome to join us at 1.30 for our chapel. And uh, that'll be a great time of kicking off our Lenten series called In View of God's Mercy. I'm looking forward to this sermon series and this Lenten theme that we have here because there is that time where we got to see God's mercy, in the, even in the midst of suffering, which I think a lot of people are experiencing. Yeah, for sure. So we're hopeful that... This theme uh, will really connect with us all in this season of life as we enter into Lent. So just wanted to like, hey, there's uh, we're trying to get outside a little bit and provide an opportunity for you to have your faith intersect with your day on Ash Wednesday. So it yeah, should be fun. Yeah, and you know, all this talk about faith intersection, it's like that's what we're supposed to do on Mondays is faith intersection. I know, man, that's really great. So uh, Pastor and I were kicking around like, what should we talk about? Like, where where's a good thing? And... Um, we kind of were drawn to um, one of our NFL players, uh, Super Bowl champion Cooper Cup. Right, who made a spectacular catch there at the end of the game for that game-winning touchdown. Wow. I mean, yeah, that was amazing. And, uh, you know, now he's a Super Bowl champ, and he had a great year, one of the top receivers in the NFL. And uh, he is a gentleman who really uh, openly wears his faith on his sleeves. You know, he makes no, he doesn't hide it or anything like that. Right, and it's interesting because you talk about that, and like, and before you said that earlier today, I'm like, I didn't realize he was that outspoken about his Christian faith. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem like the same as what we had, you know, a decade or so ago with Tim Tebow, where that was pretty much all you knew about Tim Tebow was like his faith. Right, that was what he was known for. Yeah, so um, I don't know if you guys have heard the interview, the post Super Bowl interview, where Cooper was sitting at the podium with his son on his lap, just sharing about, you know, his thoughts about the Super Bowl and the season. And he just openly said, you know, I I had a dream or a vision that um, my team would be in the Super Bowl and that we would win and that I would get the MVP. And I'm like, he just attributed it to, you know, vision from God, I guess, is where he was coming from. And so, like, when you hear that, you kind of go, hmm, wow, that's uh, really perceptive. I mean, right. like, it, it did play out that way. Right. I don't know if I've ever had a vision quite like that. No, I wish I would, you know, because that's quite a vision. Right. Makes life a little easier. (laughs) Exactly. So, you know, you might, if you're a skeptic, you might say, "Ah, I don't know about that. You know, it's almost that like cheesiness, kind of like what I felt with like Tim Tebow, especially when he was at University of Florida, where he was like the big deal, superstar quarterback. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, what a great guy he is. But I'm like, his almost, in my opinion, his Christianity came across almost like a fake, like, look at me. Mm -hmm. And maybe because it was the way that, like, the broadcasters were portrayed. I remember watching one game where they're like, if you spend 10 minutes with Tim Tebow, your life is going to be so much better. Yeah. It's like, really? Really? Yeah. Spending 10 minutes with a college kid, my life is going to be that dramatically changed? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, so, you know, you hear something like this, hey, it's great he's attributing his successes to something that he feels that God shared with him. Um, And so, in a way, he's giving God the glory, which is awesome. But then it's like, well, you know, let's dig a little farther. And so uh, PD and I went and started digging a little bit more on the life of Cooper Cup, and uh, we found some cool articles online uh, actually, before he was even in the NFL and entering into college, right? Because yeah, like honestly, up until the last few years, like it wasn't a name I would have recognized. And I mean, he's only been in the league for a few years, mm-hmm. but I think both of us are familiar with players in the NFL, especially those that are good, because we both do fantasy football. So you're kind of more aware of the players. I mean, I think he was one of the players I tried to draft, but he got drafted one draft pick before me, Cooper Cup, this year. Yeah, I had him last year for a while, like midway stream through the season. And uh, I picked him up on a on a waiver wire, and he did good for me for a while. But then I had other wide receivers on my roster, not, not this past season, but the season before. And uh, I was always hitting and missing. So, like, when I started him, he didn't do well. And then when I didn't, he would go off. And I'm like, ah. Yeah, Cooper Cup. Everybody says he's great. But when I start him, he doesn't do good, you know? Right. <laughs> so I didn't even think twice about drafting him this year. Of course, I had a, I think I was number eight draft of 10 teams. So he wasn't even around. So, yeah. And, you know, so we're not fantasy experts. So we're not going to give you your fantasy no. advice on this podcast. No, not at all. But, you know, we somewhat faith experts, right? I would hope. Well, you know, it's something we, we do every day. We so. do every day. So we have a little idea, better than fantasy sports. Yeah. But yeah, it was interesting seeing like the faith that and almost like this isn't something we talked about when we were kind of looking through this one article about how you see that faith being passed down generation to generation, starting with Cooper's grandparents, mm-hmm. who had said they were active members at a Presbyterian church here. Was it Grace or Grace of Christ Presbyterian Church? Yeah. I'm not sure exactly where that's located. Mm-hmm. But, so I'm assuming maybe the state of Washington, since he went to Eastern Washington University. Right, for his college. But then even going down then to his parents, and then to him and his brothers. Yeah, so not only was faith important, you know, generation to generation, but also football. And so uh, Cooper's grandfather, Jake, played for the New Orleans Saints. Um, And, uh, wow, that was weird. My whole screen went up and down. Like someone's playing with it. So, um, yeah, he was a former lineman with the New Orleans Saints and uh, married a lady named Carla. And uh, she stuck by his side throughout his whole career. Uh, Even, I guess they met in high school. So um, faith has been a big aspect of his grandfather, Jake, and grandmother Carla's uh, life together. So you kind of already, at Cooper's grandparents, got this intersection of, of football and faith. And then you even see that with Cooper's dad, Craig, who played at Pacific Lutheran University. Hey, hey. So there you go. Ding, ding, ding. Hey. Way to go, Lutherans. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, went to a Lutheran <laughs> University. I'm not familiar with that one. Me you neither. Know, I just, you know, I support the Concordia University of Chicago. But so there you see even picking a Lutheran University. Shameless plug right there. Shameless plug, <laughs> yes. So anybody looking to go to a great Concordia, go to Concordia University of Chicago. <laughs> Uh, 7400 Augusta Street, I believe. All right. Yeah, way to go. But, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I cut you off. <laughs> it's all good. But yeah, and then he ultimately played quarterback too as a professional, which I didn't realize. I for, didn't either. For the Arizona Cardinals and the Dallas Cowboys. And he met his wife, Karen, in college where she also played soccer. So like not just football, I guess soccer is football in other countries. Of course. So yeah. you see that sport and faith interaction in their life. And I think that's something a lot of us can relate to because we know how big f- sports are in our country these days yeah where it's a multi-billion bit dollar business and it's so many people are invested into it and then it's also that faith aspect too so you know there is that intersection of faith and sports that i think we all can relate to yeah and as the article goes on to say it was that craig uh cooper's uh, father and and mom karen uh they were in bible study groups together at college and so forth so their faith together as a couple started to grow. And uh, and now there's Cooper, who he's the oldest son of four children in his family. And he, uh, in this article, he was entering into uh, college at Eastern Washington University. Um, and he has another brother. Uh, so 
he has a younger brother, Kettner. Kettner, yeah, that yeah. played at the same university as Cooper. Must have not been as good because from what I see, he just played a couple preseason games with the Rams and now is working as a defensive specialist for where they went to college. Yeah, so um, so in the article it says, what binds the Cups together is their life's joys and trials, a devotion to each other and a love for athletics, and above all, their faith in God. And uh, you know, Cooper's dad says, this is part of who we are. Our relationship with Jesus is the center of our life. And you know, we kind of talked this about with Stephen Colbert in our last Faith Intersection, where if you're in like such a public eye viewpoint in, in entertainment or in sports, you're kind of putting yourself out there when you're showing your faith. And here, his father, Craig, says that, you know, Christ is the center of their life. Right. Which speaks to kind of even what uh, his brother Jake or Grandpa Jake was saying. A lot of players didn't have faith. But for me, football was such a challenge that faith was really a part of what I did. Mm. So kind of going to what you're talking about, where like that intersection of faith and sports or being a celebrity, whatever you want to call it, where you almost want to, people might kind of shy away from their faith because of afraid of what other people might think or react. But here you have Jake saying, there's a lot of people, so it was a challenge, but it's who I am. It's a part of my life. Yeah. So he was saying, if I'm, if I'm hearing this right, that, Football wasn't like the identifier of him, but his faith in Christ really identified who he was, and football was just something he did. And I think we all relate to that in the idea of like whatever our profession or whatever activity we're involved in, sometimes we seek our identity in those things, whether it's as a parent, Mm -hmm. spouse, pastor, teacher, police officer, firefighter, paramedic, business world accountant, whatever it might be, Mm -hmm. oh, that's where I find my identity in those things. But there's something greater that we find our identity, and that is being a child of God. Yeah, because so often in our careers or uh, those things that you had mentioned, uh, uh, the things that we do in our life that that really define our activities day in and day out, if we have like a bad day or something doesn't go right, we're all thrown for a loop, you know, and uh, we forget sometimes in those moments about where our faith enters in and, uh, you know, his... uh, Cooper's grandfather, Jake, was talking about one of those moments where he remembered he missed a a block in a big game, and it allows his opponents to, you know, snag an intercepted pass and score a touchdown, and the Saints lost the game. And he said, I went home and relived that play over and over in my mind. The only way I could get rid of it was to know that God accepts me as a person, not a performer. Right. And that's pretty cool. You know, he goes, it's not what I do that's important. It's my relationship with God. And, you know, whether you're in sports or entertainment or whatever you do in your life, we're, you know, we're so geared in this society to perform, to perform, to perform. And if we screw up or mess up in our performance, in our work life, then we think poorly upon ourselves. Right. Because I know there's times where I've messed up leading worship or messed up in a message, giving a message, and it's just like, Oh, you see, oh, I can't believe I did this. I'm so stupid. Or mm-hmm. we kind of beat ourselves up over those things. Yep, we sure do. Even pastors. Right. Yeah. And so it's just like one of those, but my identity isn't in there. Like I try to be the best that I can with the skills that God has equipped me with. Are there people probably better than me? Sure. But I'm doing what I can do with the best of my ability. Yeah. Each of us has a uniqueness that we bring to every situation. And that's why I really appreciated, uh, you know, Jake saying God accepts me as who he created me to be. I'm I'm his beloved child, and uh, he's not, like, looking at me as how I'm performing. You right. know, that's, that's really awesome. And that takes that almost relief off there because mm. our society demands that perfection. Oh, you need to always be on, need to be perfect. You make a mistake. Like, well, how could you make that mistake? And I think you see that even in sports. Like, we'll bring up a sore subject for Chicago Bears fans here, but, like, Cody Parkey, the double doink. Oh, the double doink. Like, I hate to bring this up as a oh. diehard Bears fan, and it was that was probably the most painful experience watching a Bears game in my lifetime. Oh, okay. Because, I don't know, I don't remember the 90s uh-huh. all that much. Or like, But those good games, it's like, okay, we have a good team. And he made one simple mistake, really, by, you know, a few inches one way or the mm-hmm. other. Yes, he was horrible kind of all season, but it's like... That doesn't define him. Just because he had that double doink, 
Like, God doesn't say, oh, that's how I know you. You're the double doink guy. Yeah. He says, no, you're my son. Yeah. Just like, you know, you look to when Thomas was doubting, oh, I need to put my hands where Jesus was pierced. We sadly always think of him doubting Thomas. Yeah. But it's not like when he's in heaven, she's like, hey, doubting Thomas, yeah. get over here. Come on over here. I need you to do something for me. <laughs> it's just like, hey, Thomas. Come here. Uh huh. At least that's how I assume it's going to be. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, but you're exactly right. And we, we do focus on those things humanly. And in the world of professional sports, as you said, like there is a high sense of, you know, criticalness. If you make a mistake, it could cost uh, a big thing. And um, so here, um, this was kind of, I could see where this was really bothering Jake. You know, because he he probably felt I left my teammates down, uh, my organization, um, but yet he found freedom in just remembering how God views him. Right, and that strength, and that reminds me of something to do with our fellowship of Christian athlete students here at Emmanuel FCA. When this happened about a month ago, November, a couple months, November of twenty twenty one. Mm. But after. Uh, the Indianapolis Colts just destroyed the Buffalo Bills, who were a Super Bowl contending team. Uh, Frank Reich, the coach of the Indianapolis Colts, who had a pretty well-known history for Buffalo. You remembered it when I, I mentioned did. his name a little bit. But for those who aren't familiar, like I kind of vaguely maybe remember this. Mm -hmm. But Frank Reich, before becoming the coach of the Colts and whatever other coaching stuff he did, I can't remember where, I think Eagles. But it said, you know, he was most known for Buffalo's 41-38 to overtime win in the wild card round of the 1992-93 playoffs. His Bills were trailing the Houston Oilers, who don't exist anymore. Right. They moved to Tennessee and mm -hmm. the Titans. They were down 35-3 to in the third quarter, so that's a hopeless situation if you ask me. Yeah, for sure. But Reich led the Bills on a 38-3 run to claim a stunning victory it's still the largest comeback in NFL history. Mm. You know, you hear people say 28-3, the patriots Falcons Super Bowl won. Right, right. You don't hear that one as much. But after this game, when his Colts, who he was head coach for, destroyed the Bills, Frank Reich had some great quotes after that. Like, I saw it up on Twitter, and so like I was reminded of that today when we were talking about this. You know, his first quote says, I just wanted to offer a word of encouragement, really, to anyone out there who's in the midst of a struggle. In particular, I'm thinking of a few friends who I know are going through some stuff, and I want to give a personal account to where I have found my strength to this for the journey. And he's talking about Christ, and he references his, one of his favorite hymns, In Christ Alone, which is a beautiful song. Mm -hmm. And so he referenced that song again on that Sunday, November 21st, 22nd, pointing to Christ as a source of hope. So he says, even though it was almost 30 years ago, so he's talking about that comeback game with the Bills. Right. When I read these words here in this stadium, so like even then as a player, these words were ringing true to him. But he said, this week I was reminded of Hebrews 13.8. says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Reich said, it is crazy, but here we are some 30 years later, not living in the past, but rather attempting to press on to what is ahead. So my encouragement is to keep climbing and to find strength and power that you need in Christ Jesus. Mm, press on forward. Yeah, and keep climbing with Christ. Yeah, so Great that, messages. That climbing and then that where we find our strength in that journey, because that's what life is. It's a journey that will have ups and downs, peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. And are you going to rely on your own strength or are you going to rely on Christ? Exactly. And, it, you know, it's so easy to, and maybe that's where we kind of stopped at the the post Super Bowl interview, you know, we both kind of said, "Well, it's easy to say this, you know, when when, when it did win. work out, and you won, you won the Super Bowl, you won the MVP, and that's where people could get a little, you know, like skeptical, and it's like easy to say about your faith when you win, but yeah, like you just said, when you kind of are knocked down and you use your faith to, you know, muster the strength to keep, you know, striving forward." And you see that that God is with you through those low points, and and when you you know achieve something like this, you, right. you look back and you say, "I totally saw God in all of this." And um, you know, speaking back to Cooper Cup, he actually did um, have uh, a time where he was um, had an injury in 2018. He tore in his ACL, ended his season in Week Ten, and uh, 
in a 2019 interview with uh, CBN, he said, I needed God during that time of rehabilitation. He says uh, it was one of the most grueling rehab processes from that injury um, that he ever experienced, but he attributed his success to the support system that God placed around him. And so he goes, I needed to trust in what my faith was. He goes, just having my wife and my son to push me through this, my teammates, coaching staff, training staff, the strength staff, I had everybody around me I needed to encourage me and really showed me how important people are that God placed around me in my life. Right. And I thought, well, that's really... And then he, Cooper goes on to say that that support system that he was talking about includes his father and his grandfather who played in the NFL and helped lay the foundation for his faith. So there you really see how his faith uh, formed in the foundation of his grandfather and his father, both going through uh, professional sports, helped him in this time of injury to recover. Right. And, you know, I think of the whole idea, I think we talked about it on one of the previous ones, and I know other times, the whole like power of being with other believers, that when we're on our own, that's when the devil picks us off. Right. But I also was thinking back to my time in seminary, and the fact that, like, that encouragement that I had from my brothers in Christ studying to become pastors because it was a difficult thing going through all those classes, mm -hmm. and they were going through the same experiences so we could rally around one another for that support and because they knew what we were going... We knew what each other was going through. Right, right. I don't know if you had that same experience. Totally, totally, because everybody goes through those moments and those peaks and valleys, and uh, to have people around you... Uh, is really vitally important to help you continue to press forward, kind of like what Frank Wright was saying, like just keep pushing forward, keep pushing forward, and God will have greater things in store for us. Right, and it's not saying that we're relying on those people, but it's knowing that God is working through them, and mm -hmm. that's the value of surrounding ourselves with other Christians in our life, that we know that they're going to encourage us in a Christian way, mm -hmm. give us Christian advice that lead us maybe not down a path that we shouldn't be going down. Yeah, um, and if you're really, you know, a, a believer in Christ, you can see how God places those people around you in, in your life. And then you really appreciate how God is really active in your situation and day to day and how he really truly does love you. Right. That he isn't an absent God or that he's far away, but he is there right in the midst of the people he places. It's not like, and that's where I think some people get discouraged because they don't see God or we don't see those miracles that we read about in the Old Testament, the New Testament, where we see like, oh, well, that's where God is working. Mm -hmm. It's more in those subtle ways through the people that he's worked, that he's placed in our lives. Yeah, and so often, uh, like we talked about last week with Joseph and his brothers, it took him all through that suffering, all those years living in Egypt, to finally have the light bulb go on and say, this is why God made me go through this. And so I think every one of us, if we go through a hard time in our life, whether it's injury, whether it's just a problem relationally or loss of a job, loss of a loved one, financial uh, problems, we, at some point, when we look back, we can see the goodness of God and the people that he placed around us to get us to where we're at. Right. A much stronger, hopefully, human being and more reliant upon him. Right. So we see where God intersects in our life, which mm -hmm. it's a constant intersection where he is acting in our life. Yeah, yeah, so very cool. Um, so anyway, I thought it was really cool that, uh, you know, we found a couple of NFL players and uh, see how their faith intersects, and in, uh, again, on such a big grand stage as right. the NFL. Right, especially the Super Bowl for Cooper, because mm -hmm. I, I forgot who I was talking to, but somebody was like, somebody asked why they call it the big game or the game. And they're like, because, you know, you look at other sports, baseball, basketball, hockey, there's no really one game that decides who wins the championship. It's all a seven-game series. Mm -hmm. So, yes, ultimately, whatever team is on the verge of winning game four, it's depending on that game. But in the Super Bowl, there's one shot. One shot. You don't have multiple games that you can win. Yeah. It's, so that's why it is the big game because, well... It's the biggest game in the NFL. Yeah, and the clock is winding down. Like, you know, you can just see if you're trailing in the end of the Super Bowl, you know, your fate is just dwindling. Right. And uh, so that's what makes, like, any kind of comeback, like what you were talking about with, like, Frank Wright's 
35 to 3 or the one with the Brady with 28 to 3. It makes those things more exciting. Right, because you lose game one of the World Series. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll get on the next game. Exactly. It's not a series until the home team loses. Yeah, it's not the. That's more of a long run strategy, you know. Right, but in NFL, it's that one thing. So that's the grandest stage because I would say that is the biggest sport in our country these days, mm-hmm. like compared to all the other ones. So there he is on that big spotlight because I don't know. I didn't look at the viewers, but. How many people witnessed and saw what he saw said? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people did. I, I saw it got a lot of press, particularly on social media. Mm-hmm. And uh, so good for him for living his life of faith in all areas of his right. life. Because it would be really easy for a person of faith out in a, a, a platform like NFL just to not reveal their faith and just to quietly go about it. And that's fine, too. Like, to quietly live your faith, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, being a Christian isn't all about, like, revealing in a grand way. But when, when you know, God prompts us to share, it's a wonderful opportunity yeah. to witness. To be open. You know, I think of the one podcast I listen to, they're kind of make, and they've had this person on with Rob Lowe, the actor. Mm. They kind of made fun of him a couple of years ago because in the playoffs, all he had on was a hat that said NFL. Oh, right. And they're like, you're a fan of the NFL? Not letting your allegiance to whatever team you're actually a fan of. And the same, like, that's what the concept was saying. It was like, okay, we're a fan of Jesus, but we just don't want everybody to know, like, we are really a fan of him by supporting him, by wearing something that identifies us as being a fan yeah. of Jesus. I remember that. I remember you and I talking about that. It's like, NFL hat? (laughs) Who does that? Rob Lowe, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's better than wearing uh, a different team's hat that's that's not not in the game. Playing at the stadium. That's that's one of my big pet peeves as a sports fan. Yeah, for sure. Well, we hope that uh, it's been enjoyable for you to uh, check in with our conversation today and just know that you know, uh, you as a person who's not on a high platform such as the NFL or in entertainment on a TV show, um, you know, God has given you an opportunity to be open in your faith, to show and shine the light of Christ in moments where God will direct you and share and show you how to do that. And that happens not only when things are going great, but more so when things are tough and struggling in your life. And even just everyday life, because, I mean, I'll kind of wrap up my point here. Something that happened last week when we were flying to Phoenix and all going to Phoenix going for best practices. So I was wearing my one baseball hat because, as we talked about last week, the concept of the one, you know, we got merchandise for the one. So I had it on. I was at O'Hara dropping off my luggage to be checked in. All of a sudden, the lady at the desk was like, oh, I really like your hat. So it opened up that little bit of a conversation about what the hat was about. Hey, yeah, I'm a pastor. Some of my church is doing. And she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a believer. And she kind of talked about the church she went to before some stuff happened. And then even later that day when I was in Phoenix at Camelback, hiking up that with my sister-in-law, somebody there was like, oh, I like your hat. I'm a believer, too. And a little conversation was sparked. So that's, you know, that faith intersections as well, just, mm-hmm. you know, being open and being okay with wearing something that identifies you as a Christian, and you never know the doors that that's going to open. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of the one merchandise, that's available for you, friends, at Emmanuel. Uh, Pastor Donald has a whole stock full of sweatshirts, uh, polo shirts, baseball hat. Beanies. Beanies for uh, winter. And, uh, you know, uh, they're very moderately priced, but the proceeds of those sales will go to directly, 100%, to help victims of um, tornadoes and things that happened a couple months ago. Right, and through Lutheran Church Charities. Lutheran Church, yeah. So uh, seek out Pastor Donald, uh, PD. Say, hey, when you come to Emmanuel, where's PD? I want to buy some One Merch. So this podcast is ver- sponsored by the One Merch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed it was. <laughs> so so thank you all for tuning in this week and looking forward to talking more with P-Dubs here and having you guys listen in on our conversations. Thank mm-hmm. you.